Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar presentation. Um, today we're going to cover, be covering kind of a variety of topics in an effort to provide kind of an overall update on the international trade industry throughout this first quarter of 2023. My name is Meredith and I am your host for today's presentation. If you are subscribed to our newsletter, you may recognize my name from our bi-weekly educational emails. So keep an eye out for those. Joining me today is Travis Smith and Josh Froberg. These are two of the experts here at TRG. Between the two of them, there are over 20 years of experience in international trade uh, and more specifically on US customs bonds. This webinar is being presented by Trade Risk Guarantee, also known as TRG. We are located in downtown Bozeman, Montana, and we have been providing U.S. customs bonds and cargo insurance solutions directly to importers since 1991. This direct to importer business model is unique to the international trade community since it cuts out the need for an additional middleman and allows TRG to become another member of your international trade team. Now we will be recording this webinar and it will be available on YouTube for future reference. If you want to be notified the moment it releases, I highly recommend you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We also post additional educational videos on YouTube about once a month or so. So if you're not already, I would suggest you go ahead and subscribe. Uh, you can find us by searching trade risk guarantee hyphen TRG in YouTube. A link to, to subscribe will be sent uh, with the recording of this webinar following today's presentation. Now, please remember to submit your questions in the questions box in the webinar interface throughout the presentation. We will be answering as many of them as we can at the end of the webinar. However, if any questions uh, come up during this presentation that we do not have time to get to, they will be reviewed and answered shortly after the presentation. And of course, as a quick reminder, this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. Now, in today's webinar, we are going to go over three primary topics. First, we're going to discuss a few different headlines that are currently trending within the international trade industry. Then we are gonna go over some data and information released in a recent report by the GAO. And finally, we wanted to take a moment to explain stacking bond liability and how can that how that can imp impact an importer. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to Travis, who is going to discuss the updates within the international trade industry. Great, thank you, Meredith. So, in first quarter of 2022, in the trade world, it's impossible not to talk about dr the dramatic drop in container pricing. We saw prices. Uh, north of $20,000 to move a container from China to the U.S., uh, sometimes as high as $25,000, but right now it's reported at an average cost of about $1,400. Also of note is, is if you are a BCO or beneficial cargo owner and you're negotiating directly with the shipping line, if you have volume high enough, it sounds like rates from China are as low as $1,000, so likely some BCOs are getting rate, uh, rates as low as 900 or less than 1,000, so get out there and negotiate, and that's an indication that that $1,400 figure likely will drop lower. Um, and we, we do keep in mind that some shippers are mid-contract, so you may feel locked in to higher rates, um, maybe, maybe pandemic era rates. Um, if you are mid-contract, be aggressive, reach out, and renegotiate. Companies are renegotiating their contracts and getting much lower terms, so take the time to do that. And here on this next slide, this is it. This is a roller coaster you all just experienced, that steep ramp up, and then in 2022, it almost dropped as quickly as it went up, which was a huge relief to everybody. Uh, likely, we're at pre-pandemic rates right now, and It'll be yet to see if we really fall below pre-pandemic rates, which, which you know, could happen. Um, and what does this mean for you? Naturally, you're going to save money. Everybody celebrate that. Um, but at the end of the day, you got to note that U.S. inventories are high, warehouses are full, 
shipping lines have excess capacity and those service providers, those customs brokers, freight forwarders, logistics consultants, they have more time on their hands. They're eager for business and likely you're getting calls from those service providers asking to work with you or quote your business. So it's a great time for you to go back to your current relationships and get better pricing, possibly better service or move to a new provider. So from there, we're gonna revisit a topic we haven't talked about in a while, being the 301 and 232 tariffs, the trade war. The big date we have on our calendars that we're eyeing is September 2023, which is the deadline for the government to extend the exemptions that are in place for these tariffs. Now, it's a safe bet that those exemptions will be extended, but it doesn't always happen that way. Now, one reason we're talking about 301 and 232 tariffs today is because the International Trade Commission came out with a report, I think it was last week or the week before, um, looking back at these tariffs and seeing how they have impacted not the economy as a whole, because you'll see on this slide in the upper right hand corner, the ITC highlights that this is not a look at the U.S. economy at the, as a whole and an impact of these tariffs on the whole U.S. economy, but, but rather it focuses on the importers. So that bold part on the bottom. Let's read that really quick. The report finds that U.S. importers bore nearly the full cost of these tariffs because import prices increased at the same rate as tariffs. The U.S. ITC estimated that prices increased by about 1% for each 1% increase in the tariffs under Section 232 and 301. So this is maybe the look back on data that a lot of us have been wanting to see and we're gonna jump into the numbers more specifically here. We're looking at the 232 steel and aluminum tariffs. With steel, the ITC found that it, the imports of affected steel products dropped by 24%, so that is a big reduction. Um, increase, it, in, the, the price of steel products in the United States increased by 2.4%. So there you go. The increase in price did not match the 25% tariff. So who took the hit? It was the importer. So likely you listening to this webinar saw this in your balance sheets if you're in steel and aluminum, but your profit margin was cut in two significantly. Uh, we saw similar numbers with aluminum, a bigger drop of um, affected aluminum products by 31%. Um, increase of aluminum products uh, price by 1.6% in the US. Increase US production of aluminum products by 3.6%. So the US steel and aluminum mills are busier, but one of the stated goals of the 232 tariffs was for US aluminum and steel mills to reach or exceed 80% capacity that has not happened so yet to see if that will happen over the next two three years but that was one of the goals of the tariffs and that hasn't happened yet moving on from 232 a specific look at 301 across all sectors there was a reduction of imports from china by 13 percent now is that a direct result of only the 301 tariffs no there are other factors but that is a big drop in imports from china um, increased value of uh, increase the value of U.S. production by 0.4%. Uh, the price of U.S. product by 0.2%. So not a huge jump in price as a result of these 301 tariffs, according to this report. Looking at 301 tar tariffs on specific industries, it gets a little more interesting. Um, computer equipment, the importing dropped by 5%. Uh, semiconductors, a, a big drop of 72%, but again, is it only due to 301 tariffs? No, a big factor in that is that the federal government has um, invested heavily in U.S. manufacturing, so we're seeing factories for uh, these chips being built in the U.S. And with the 301 tariffs, one of the stated goals was to deter China from their alleged theft of IT property and trade secrets of the US. The report didn't hit on that topic too heavily, but we'll see if the, the government comes out and talks more about that in relation to 301 tariffs in the future. Now, 
from 301 or 232, another uh, federal government related topic is the possible return of the GSP. Now, GSP stands for Generalized Systems of Preferences, and the GSP is designed to promote development in lower income countries. And it is a law, a US law that has been in the books since the 1970s, but it lapsed in 2021. So GSP is intended to promote business between the U.S. and low-income countries by reducing those taxes and duties. It had been in place for 50 years now, but it lapsed in 2021. The federal government couldn't get it renewed. So those companies that were enjoying the preferred duties and taxes are not currently enjoying them. Now, if the government can renew the GSP, what will that mean for importers? Companies that are importing under the GSP or from GSP countries uh, can file for a reimbursement of those duties. So that can be a lot of money. The reimbursement does not include interest. So you're out of luck there. Um, if the GSP is renewed, it would be another incentive for companies to look for business outside of China. Now, in a letter from the Biden administration noted that the GSP allows domestic manufacturers and consumers to diversify supplier sources and limit vulnerability, strengthen the U.S. supply chain, uh, and ensure economic stability. So who couldn't get behind that? Um, it does feel like there's a lot of talk within the government of getting this done and, and reinstating GSP which would be a big win. And with all of this, there's a common thread and there, there's a move away from importing from China as a result of the 301-232 tariffs, increased export controls on computer chips from China. So that's, that's exporting from the U.S. to China, but it does indicate um, the stress that the U.S.-China trade relationships is, is under right now. Um, China experienced the extreme lockdown with factories as a result of their zero COVID um, stance, which was recently removed, but that resulted in China not being able to deliver on orders to the U.S., et cetera. Now, that et cetera does include a lot of other talking points. Uh, there's the UFLPA, or Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which was recently in, enacted and is actively detaining containers coming into the U.S. Um, in this, this UFLPA law is intended to eliminate the use of China of forced labor to produce goods for the U.S., but that's another stress with importing from China. There's also proposed new leg legislation to keep an eye on. Specifically, now there's a focus not only on China, but all trade that may be gaining an unfair advantage in the U.S. market. In three um, legislation bills that are that you should keep an eye on are the Fighting Trade Cheat Act, the China Grand Strategy Commission Bill, and the American Innovation and Jobs Act. Now, these all involve international trade, unfair practices with a focus on China, but they all include bipartisan support, which is a big key takeaway. It feels like the federal government can agree on getting more strict and giving more attention to international trade. And where does that leave us? A lot of U.S. companies are focusing on reshoring or friendshoring. Now, you know, you hear reshoring, many of you out there are probably rolling your eyes in the back of your head saying, yeah, it's impossible. And it is. It's too expensive for many companies to bring uh, manufacturing back to the U.S. But friendshoring is more realistic. And friendshoring is the manufacturing, is moving the manufacturing and sourcing to countries with shared values of the U.S. Friendshoring was a term initially coined at the beginning of the pandemic, and it was initially referred to as allied shoring, but then you heard Janet Yellen using it in her speeches, and it was a talking point in Davos. Also on the TRG floor, a lot of the companies we're talking with, they're moving to Mexico or Canada or, or not completely out of China, but possibly diversifying so they can you know, better handle possible shockwaves. And from there, we are going to talk a bit about anti-dumping and countervailing. 
what's triggering us to visit anti-dumping countervailing today is a report that came out about a month ago from the government accountability office so over the years of talking to clients about anti-dumping or countervailing many of them feel targeted or they, they wonder the intent behind the anti-dumping case or petition now this report was super interesting because it kind of pulled back the curtains and did provide a lot of data and talking points about this topic specifically they did this report uh, because some companies contended that domestic companies may sometimes file petitions for anti-dumping without merit to obstruct domestic market competition. Other companies asserted that such duties could have adverse effects on other economic sectors, such as increased costs for downstream purchasers. Now, the report found that the process to file a petition, the time spent, the money spent, you gotta hire a customs attorney to do this, is too cumbersome for a company to go through the process fully to do it for other than um, genuine intent. Um, so the, the, the process is cumbersome, it's expensive, like any other government involvement, but also it, it's important to note that they pointed out that advocates for these duties contend that trade remedy that these trade remedies help exist to help ensure a level playing field in a global economy and they do mitigate the adverse effects of unfair trade practices on domestic industries and workers so that's a lot to take in but this tool anti-dumping or countervailing is what is used to try to keep foreign or any manufacturers around the world from engaging in unfair trade practices to gain a monopoly in their industries. So thinking back 20 years, um, ball bearings from China were a big anti-dumping case. And that case is no longer um, active. But if, if, we, if there, an argument can be made that if anti-dumping or countervailing were not a tool for international trade, those Chinese manufacturers would have succeeded in driving out international competition, resulting in a global monopoly on the ball bearing industry, which, uh, you know, there's a lot of money in ball bearings. So you got to keep that in mind when you're thinking about these, these sticky anti-dumping and countervailing topics, because, you know, clients feel targeted. It's, it's not about the individual company. And this report is very helpful by, to put anti-dumping and countervailing in context. We will be mailing out the full report after the webinar, as well as the ITC report on 232 and 301 tariffs. But to dig further into this anti-dumping report, as I mentioned, there was a lot of good data on the report. And I'm gonna hand this over to Josh now to talk about some of these, um, some of this data. Yeah, so um, here's kind of a breakdown of the results that they found. And um, this is for a 10 year period from 2011 through 2021. Um, and as you can see, there were 585 cases that were petitioned during that time. Um, of those, there was 564. So about 96% of them that resulted in a positive af affirmative uh, result, or I'm sorry, positive affirmation of injury to the domestic product. And what that means is that at that point, uh, customs would start enforcing a margin on those those entries, and those entries would start to become suspended by customs. Um, so they wouldn't just follow the regular standard uh, entry process at that point. Um, so keep in mind also that at that point that there is the affirmative US ITC determination of injury, they could potentially go back 90 days if they determine that there's critical circumstances and suspend entries that have already been made for the past 90 days. Um, that's a very rare occurrence, but it has happened. Um, and then from that, we see that 430 of the 564 that had the initial affirmative USITC determination of injury ended up as 
an actual anti-dumping or countervailing duty order. Um, so at that point, everything gets suspended. When it comes in, there's a margin that's paid at the time of entry. Um, the finalized margins are no longer capped, whereas prior to that order coming down, the, the finalized margins are capped at what was paid at the time of entry. So you may get a refund, you may not, but it's it's capped at what it was. But now it's kind of just up in the air. Um, it could explode to an additional 1% that's due. It could go all the way up to like 300% sometimes. Um, so it really gets very tricky once that order is in place. So um, I, on this page, you can see that out of those cases that were petitioned to begin with, 74% of them did result in the ADCBD order coming down. Um, So basically what, what that means is that if there's a petition filed against your goods, you can by and large assume that it's going to end up as some sort of an anti-dumping or countervailing case against those goods. Um, and you should start to try to prepare for any adjustments that you can make to your importing, which would be if you have a diverse supply chain, maybe start moving more away from that particular country into a different one. Um, so here's the graph of the petitions filed and the orders granted in, in general over that 10 year span that we were talking about. And as you can see, more than half of the petitions end up winding up as orders and with the 10 year average being about 74%. Um, and Travis, I know that we see this, this graph and we see 2020 as kind of an outlier in that. Um, did you want to go into some detail of what that could possibly be attributed to? So yeah, as Josh mentioned, there is a jump in cases in 2020, about um, what 112 or so. There, there's no um, word from the government why there were more, more cases during that year. We talked about it a bit internally, kind of just speculation is that possibly the Department of Commerce had a backlog or more cases that they wanted to self-initiate rather than the more traditional initiation through the private sector. So maybe that's it. Um, possibly there's another cause or possibly there's no rhyme or reason to it, just an exceptionally high year of petitions and cases. So the overall takeaway, um, you know, we talked about 2020 and why they had a higher petition rate or why we suspect maybe, but the overall takeaway is you're the importer of record. You need to be aware of anti-dumping. If you're not subject to anti-dumping currently and there's word or you see a petition that involves your goods that you actively import, the two things you can do is number one, as Josh mentioned, start to possibly find a supplier that's not subject to anti-dumping, maybe in another country, or if it's supplier, manu uh, supplier specific or manufacturer specific, you can find somebody in the same country. But you gotta look to diversify your supply chain. And the second thing you need to do internally is prepare to possibly place collateral to keep your required import bond on file. Um, it, it's very, very common across the industry that if you bring in any level of anti-dumping, the bond provider, the insurance company underwriting the bond is gonna require some level of collateral to keep that bond on file. So those are the two, maybe the two biggest takeaways from this. You know, I don't think any of us are ever gonna fully understand anti-dumping uh, the way maybe a trade attorney does, unless we have any trade attorneys on this webinar, I hope we do. But th those are the actions you can take if your goods are on a petition. And from here, you know, one thing with anti-dumping and when with that we need you to understand is stacking bond liability. So stacking liability occurs when a surety company or an insurance company has open exposure or unliquidated customs entries over multiple bond periods. 
The liquidation time frame remains suspended for entries made that are subject to anti-dumping or counter, uh, countervailing for an undetermined time. Therefore, anti-dumping entries and countervailing entries, this bond stacking liability is, is carried out for a much longer time frame. And this is a this is a difficult um, kind of concept to grasp, but it's important for importers to know it. So we have about three slides here that Josh is going to go over and talk about stacking liability. Yeah. So um, what we'll do is we'll start with the standard type O1 entries, which are just your typical entries, not subject to any anti-dumping or countervailing, um, and those will come in, and they will not be suspended or extended. Um, they'll, they'll just come in, be unliquidated for a time period up to 365 days, at which point, if they're not already liquidated by customs, they would liquidate by operation of law. So what that means is that you would have a tail of liability from on your imports for one year from the, the date of entry um, or from the current date. So if you have a $50,000 bond that let's say that the effective date is today, 3-23-23. Um, that would run through 3-22-24, and that would be your one-year $50,000 bond period. So you would be in this current bond period with $50,000 of bond liability open. Then on 3-23-24, you'd be entering your next $50,000 bond period. So as you move through that next $50,000 bond period, the entries from the previous bond period would continue to liquidate until you get to the end of year two. At that point, you would still only have $50,000 of open bond liability because the, the initial first year bond liability will have liquidated by then. Um, so basically, if you have a $50,000 bond and have standard entries, you're always going to be juggling between $50,000 of bond liability and $100,000. And it's just going to keep on going up and down between those two numbers. Um, that's much different when it comes to anti-dumping and countervailing, where, like I said, instead of those entries being unliquidated for a year, they end up being suspended, which means that they're not going to liquidate until that suspension is lifted, which doesn't happen until the US ITC actually gives customs instructions to liquidate those goods, which could be five years or more down the line. It's really, it's an ongoing case where the US ITC and the Department of Commerce is looking into the various factors to determine what the correct margin is on those goods. So in that same scenario of the first year bond being starting today, running through 322-24, um, we would get to 323.24. Again, we'd have $100,000 of open bond liability at that point. But the difference would be that at the end of year two, we would still have entries from year one open and suspended. So now entering year three, now we have $150,000 of bond liability. Um, same thing, we get to the end of year three, entering year four, and Entries from the first $50,000 bond period are still suspended and unliquidated. So now you're looking at, on a $50,000 bond, a total stacked exposure of $200,000 over a four-year period. Um, and that, there is no set timeline for that, so it can just continue to pile up $50,000 every year that the bond is on file. Um, and then it's it's important to remember that, you know, like Travis said, even a small amount of anti-dumping will hold up the liquidation of a bond period. So in this last scenario, we have anti-dumping and countervailing goods mixed in with standard type 01 entries for that first year. And then we get to year two, we've got $100,000 of bond liability. But in that second year, there's only standard type 01 entries coming in. That means that by the end of year three, that second bond period will have liquidated because it would have liquidated by operation of law at that point. 
but we still have that outstanding liability from that first bond period. So even by the end of year three, we still have $100,000 of bond liability. Um, but most of the time between years, I guess most of the time through year three, it's going to be 150,000 of bond liability open. Um, so rather than bouncing between 50,000 and 100,000, now we're bouncing between 100,000 and 150,000. Yeah, thanks, Josh. And you know that stacking collateral is is a key point, and it's good to review those slides, as I'm sure you'll 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 do to try to grasp it better. And you know, moving moving from that data on anti-dumping, if you can't tell. Here at TRG, we have a big focus on anti-dumping. We've always written anti-dumping bonds, but over the past four months or so, we've been releasing a new approach that we can qualify some anti-dumping importers for, which could provide you with a much more favorable option to secure the import bond. Um, if you're at all involved with anti-dumping, please go to that website listed at the bottom of the page, fill out that form and let us know so we can have a discussion. Uh, we feel we have a unique approach to anti-dumping and countervailing to write the bond that some companies will qualify for, not everybody, but it's worth having a conversation with us to see if we can give you an option you like better than your current situation. Okay, so um, at this point, we're going to open up to questions. We've already had a couple come in. Uh, so we're going to kind of go through some of those. But again, if you have any questions that have come up that you haven't typed in yet, uh, take a moment, submit those questions. While you all submit those questions, uh, Travis is going to tell us a little bit more about TRG, and then we're going to go ahead and get into those. Yeah, TRG, we're an insurance agency in Bozeman, Montana. We spend nearly 99% of our business on U.S. customs bonds and cargo insurance. Um, we, we write a lot of cargo insurance, so if you guys are open to a quote or want to revisit the coverage you have in place or just have questions about cargo insurance, let us know. As I mentioned a second ago, we have a focus on anti-dumping, so if you're subject to anti-dumping or countervailing, uh, give us a call or fill out the form from the uh, slide two slides ago. All right, let's get into some of these questions. Uh, this first one is about uh, the container shipping uh, section. Uh, the question is about uh, how about shipping from Europe, Italy, Turkey, and India? Uh, so originally on that graph that we provided, it kind of showed um, how all uh, shipping to the U.S. from basically around the world. It had different colors for the different um, regions of the world. And pretty much all of them did follow that you know, kind of roller coaster of mountain to slowly falling back to pre-pandemic pricing. Uh, uh, Europe has been a little slower on that front, um, particularly to the East Coast, I believe. Um, there was still some higher prices, but for the most part, everything is following that trend of falling back to what we would consider more normal pricing in the industry. Uh, have you heard anything else, Travis, about any of those regions specifically? Not, not specific. I mean, you know, it, when I when I talk to clients about um, freight costs, you know, TRG is not a freight forwarder. We don't quote freight, but I always enjoy asking clients what they're paying for freight right now. And it the reason I enjoy it is because generally the client lasts a little bit and gets pretty happy because prices are down. So Arturo, I don't know if that directly answers your question, but we can look into it a little bit more and maybe send you some correspondence on that uh, later. Now the next question, and this this is a tough one. Given the China-Taiwan potential conflict, would you also recommend moving away from Taiwan as well? Man, um, I don't know. You know, it, it does seem heated in more of a contentious relationship than ever before with the potential for military conflict. Um, I would say, I would say it's a very very good idea to look at diversifying and be aware of suppliers in other regions of the world. Uh, I don't know if you pull the trigger and move your your suppliers, just move from Taiwan altogether. Uh, I'd imagine you know you have a good relationship with those folks and they deserve your business. But you know that is a good point. Given that potential conflict, you want to be aware of other suppliers in other regions of the world that you could potentially work with very quickly if something breaks out. Yeah, yeah I think uh, the general takeaway from. I, I, 
it's like we hate to give a we don't know answer, but ultimately when it comes to those kinds of global conflicts, the only advice we can give is to keep a close eye on it and to kind of prepare yourself in the event that something happens. Um, but, you know, ultimately, we're just going to have to wait and see how that pans out. And then we have an interesting question. Does this stacking bond liability also apply to uh, Canadian bonds and anti-dumping? And yeah, absolutely. You know, we have we have great relations with Canada or with um, with Canada and, you know, very favorable trade terms, but um, stacking liability is a factor for standard entries made from Canada, as well as anti-dumping and countervailing. There are anti-dumping and countervailing cases involving Canadian manufacturer and Canadian goods, uh, some lumber, uh, some paper goods, but just, just simply importing from Canada does not uh, take away that stacking liability aspect. Uh, so I think this question, though, is also asking about the upcoming Canadian bonds. So the bonds oh, that are going to be... Oh, the Canadian be, bonds. Yeah. yeah, so the Canadian... I mean, again, uh, Andy, I, I hope we're understanding correctly, but uh, there are some new, you know, a new bond that is going to become required if you are a U.S. Uh, if you're an importer of record into Canada. Yes. So Canada had not traditionally had a requirement for um, an import bond similar to the U.S. import bond for the importer of record. Now they have a soft deadline of later this year um, requiring a similar bond. That, 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 that date might be pushed back. It likely will be pushed back. Um, but Andy, uh, they, there is Canadian Customs does recognize anti-dumping and countervailing. Um, I'm not going to dive deep into the stacking collateral effect are, on Canadian it, it, bonds. <laughs> it is hard for us to answer this because honestly, we, you know, as a as a bond provider, we have been very involved in, you know, keeping updated on what's going on with Canadian bonds. What is it going to take to get these placed for importers? Um, and honestly, a lot of that information is still pending. So we have directly spoken to some officials from. Um, uh, Canadian customs, specifically about anti-dumping. And the answer was a little bit more amorphous than we would have liked. Uh, it's basically, they're still focusing on one aspect of getting these bonds in place. Uh, the How this is going to affect their anti-dumping orders is still a little unclear, but for all intents and purposes, they are moving toward a model that emulates a little bit more what we're used to in the U.S. So we would expect for the stacking bond liability to be similar in the future for Canadian bonds. Yeah, I think uh, so. This other question that we've gotten is a little too specific for us at the moment. Um, I'm going to have to do some research and maybe reach back out to you on that one. Um, but yeah, I think that's all the questions we also have time for today. We like to keep these under an hour for you all to make them easy to get in here, get the information, ask some questions. If you do have any more questions following this webinar, feel free to reach out. Uh, we, you know, we love getting your questions. We love taking the time. And obviously, we really enjoy talking about all of this. Um, let's... Yeah, so there, there are the modes of reaching out to us. Uh, yeah, if so, you have any more questions, reach out. Yeah, and thank you all for attending the webinar today. Uh, if Again, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can reach out to me directly at marketing at traderiskguarantee.com um, or using any, you know, we have forms on our website or any of the emails in the beginning of this presentation. Additionally, check out our blog, tradersguarantee.com slash TRGPeak. It's got excellent articles and information. And don't forget to find us on LinkedIn and, of course, YouTube. We will be sending a follow-up email tomorrow with links from the presentation as well as with the recording um, of this webinar. So look out in your inbox for that. Uh, thank you again, everyone.